Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for The Bad Batch Season 3. Or I should say Star Wars The Bad Batch Season 3. So, um, in this video I will cover every single episode of Season 3 of The Bad Batch. So if you have not seen all of Season 3 of The Bad Batch, you will not want to watch this video. Otherwise, some things will be spoiled for you. So, um, starting with my overall feelings on the season. So, I've never actually... I wasn't, haven't been a huge fan of the Bad Batch, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, out of the three main Star Wars animated shows, not counting crap like Resistance or shorts like, you know, Tales from the, the Tales of the Jedi or whatever it's called, just the three main animated ones, Clone Wars, Rebels, and the Bad Batch. This is my least favorite of the three, easily. Very easily my least favorite of the three. Um, my favorite's actually Rebels, which I think is highly underrated. Um, so I wasn't that highly motivated to watch this season. I waited till it finished airing and then I binged it all at once. Um, and I was, and I kind of did it out of obligation a little bit because I, I'm a completionist. I started watching it, so I want to finish watching, and plus I started reviewing it, so I want to finish my reviews for it. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to give it a shot, but I wasn't all that eager to see it, if you know what I mean. Um, and it's not like I don't like it. I thought the first two seasons were all well and good, just didn't blow me away or anything i wasn't like really looking forward to it to say the way i'm looking forward to the next season of house of the dragon or or the next season of um strange new worlds or the next season of lower decks but um you know after i watched it i was pleasantly surprised it was actually a lot better than i thought it would be um it reminded me a lot of season four of Rebels, although nowhere near as good. <laughs> um, but it had that um, that same feeling. And I think, so I feel like there was a lot of silly, filler, cartoonish BS that was in the first two seasons that wasn't really present. Uh, in this season, this season seemed pretty much pretty action-packed, pretty get-and-go, and it had a pretty cohesive season-long story arc that did kind of weave in bit. That it's not like there weren't any filler episodes. There were, which I'll address. But they they didn't have a stupid racing bullshit from like they did in season two, or just so, you know. And that character was Sid, who ran the bar, who betrayed them. Like she was a waste of time. So it's good that we got rid of her. Um, but yeah, so I think the season's easily the best of the three. Uh, but that being said, I, again, I wasn't blown away by it. It was just a lot better than I thought it would be. So, um, let's go ahead and jump into the episode. So the first episode of the season is called Confined, uh, which just shows uh, Omega who had been captured at the end of the previous season and her what it's like for her at the facility and her and this is a good introduction to the facility getting us used to what it's like and the characters that are there on uh, her meeting emory carr and uh we get more from uh, dr hemlock uh and how evil he is and her sort of trying to i don't know it's very it reminded me a lot of a lot of other episodes and a lot of other shows where the main characters are captured or in prison or something just for an episode and they go through a routine and how dreary it is. So, you know, I actually found this episode kind of boring, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But it was, you know, a good setup for the rest of the season. But it's not like the season began with a bang. It's kind of, it was kind of dull. So then the next episode was Paths Unknown, uh, where we jump back to Hunter and Wrecker 
as they go on an adventure looking for Omega, but it turns out that it's not Omega, it was just some other boys. And I gotta be completely honest here, I fell asleep during this episode, and I had... Uh, I didn't miss the whole thing, but I missed most of it. And I, after I woke up and saw the ending, I'm like, I had no desire to go back and watch it. <laughs> because it looked boring. This is that filler thing I was talking about. It's just to show, hey, what are Hunter and Wrecker up to? So let's have them go on this random adventure that doesn't have anything to do with anything. Or maybe I'm wrong because I slept through it. I mean, if someone can tell me in the comments if, if I really need to go back and watch this episode in order to understand the series, but I doubt that I do. So I didn't care for that one. Anyway, uh, next episode is Shadows of Tantus. Is that how it's pronounced? Tantus? I think so. Anyway, this is the one where Omega and Crosshair escape. Uh, from the prison. It's a very exciting episode. This is when the season finally got started, in my opinion, or at least got kicked into gear. Um, and I'm glad that they didn't wait too long for Omega to break out of prison, but that being said, she gets put back in later in the season. Um, but I, I was expecting that, though. But anyway, uh, but I'm glad they didn't stretch this out for too long. Like, Lost did stretch it out for, like, six episodes. That's what it reminded me of. Episode 1 reminded me of Lost, Season 3, Episode 1, where they were trapped by the others. But anyway, um, which is also not very good. But anyway, um, but no, this is a good episode um, where um, the Emperor is coming to visit, and so um, they um, didn't have what's her face the communion uh do the test because she usually destroys omega's blood because she knows that omega has the high end count which i'll get into that later um and um and so she wasn't able to test the blood it was emory and so emory actually tested it and so um she warned not emory but the communion lady she warned uh omega that she needed to escape immediately because she knew that she'd be in trouble if she didn't and so as she makes her plan with um crosshair and then her pet uh what's his pet's name is it badger he comes and uh he comes and saves the uh saves them when they're all about to be captured back by the stormtroopers i thought i liked badger it was a bit silly because all she did is healed his wounds once and then all of a sudden um he's domesticated when he was wild before that's a bit of a stretch and he's like completely de devoted to her now which but whatever um god i was looking at the credits i didn't realize ian mcdermott did the voice for palpatine I can't remember if he did it for any of the other animated shows. Maybe he did. Maybe he did for Clone Wars Season 7. I know that Season 6, it was Tim Curry who did the voice. But anyway, that's interesting. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So yeah, that was that was uh, really exciting. So this, is, this really is probably one of the better episodes uh, of the season. So next episode we got was A Different Approach which again follows omega and crosshairs as they try to escape and they their sh you know ship crashes and they go end up on this planet where they go to this like black market type place but the empire is there and this is fat guy who runs it and they try to they need money and so they have to omega has to game play cards in order to get money i'm so sick of that cliche this is this is when it feels a bit cartoonish and there's so many like discovery did this and there's so many shows that oh we need money to get their thing so let's play cards <laughs> like gonna, I, that's just a cliche and I, i'm kind of sick of it um but then, of course, that fat guy was being a dick, and he, like, tricked him and captured the hound because he knew they'd come after him and because he knew who they were and tried to capture them, which is, you know, whatever. But um, it was interesting that they, um, it was actually liked how all the, they made all the animals, freed all the animals to create chaos, and, and Crosshair used that distraction to, you know, get all the people and... And then the uh, the fat guy got horribly consumed, ripped to shreds by a giant beast. That's uh, that's pretty 
fucking brutal. <laughs> but anyway, um, but yeah, so this episode was okay. It, it, I hated the gambling stuff, but other than that, it was fine. So, uh, next episode was is The Return, where we see uh, Omega... Well, actually, it happened at the end of the previous episode, where Omega met up with Hunter and um, Wrecker, which is very touching. But we get to see uh, them back in their normal lives, but they realize... But Omega has to try to convince Wrecker and Hunter that... Well, particularly Hunter, that they need to go back to Tan... Tantus, I believe it's, is it Tantalus? No, it's Tantalus is from Mirror Mirror, I think. I think it's Tantus. Anyway, they need to go back there to rescue the rest of the clones. Um, and he doesn't want to, but then they talk him into it. So they go to this uh, ice polar uh, station that Crosshairs know where they can hook up the thing, the pad that they stole to uh, Empire Technology in order to find, try to find the coordinates. But when they get there, they're like, "Oh, there's no power because there's power to these useless things." So let's turn them off. That nothing bad will happen from doing that. And of course, a giant fucking beast shows up that's trying to kill them, so they have to chase it out and 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 turn the things back on, which. I don't know if I'd call this a filler episode exactly, but it's kind of, kind of is. Uh, because that storyline was kind of a distraction. But it's fine, again. So the next episode was Infiltration. It's part one of two. as when uh, Rex um, is... I like it how it follows like Rex and these other people at first. And, um, and how he... Um, they're being hunted by these weird... I'm just going to call them super soldiers. I don't remember what they're called in, in the show itself, but they're essentially super soldiers. Essentially the winter soldier, basically. It's like the clone... Uh, clones turn into the winter soldier. So I'm just going to call them super soldiers. So the super soldiers... Um, and they capture one of them and take it back to the planet, but uh, to their base. But of course, he won't talk. And they're not. And they're actually being very overconfident and naive, thinking, "Oh yeah, there's no way they can track us. We got rid of all the tracking devices, but there's still tracking devices." And they freaking call up uh, Omega and um, Hunter to be like, "Oh, we need you to come here because you gotta confirm this thing because oh because Omega turned up on his hit list and they wanted to know why so that's very smart make them come to you <laughs> your compromised base and of course that did not turn out well because one of the super soldiers tracked them there and um, started creating chaos and killing all a lot of Rex's men so that leads us into part two, uh, the infiltration, or just infiltration. Um, no, sorry, that was infiltration. Part two is extraction. Pardon me. So extraction is part two. And um, so this, I like this episode a little bit better. I mean, it's the, the two-parter itself was a very good two-parter. I think the second part is probably the better of the two-parter. But the yeah, but it was a really strong two parter, I think, for the season, even though Rex was kind of a moron. But it's really part two is actually when um, they're trying to escape and trying to get away from all the troops that are coming, and um, it's led by Wolf. And I didn't because I was thinking to myself, like, during watching this, like, who were those two people who were with Rex? and um rebels you know years later he's like old and retired with two other clones and i can't remember who they are and um i watched a video on youtube that reminded me that one of them was wolf and wolf is apparently the the guy who's hunting him in this episode but of course rex convinces them to let him go at the end of the episode and i was like oh so that's a guy who's with them in the rebels okay so it kind of makes sense now that he would let them go because they end up becoming good friends um so that was an interesting tidbit i did not remember or not realize but um yeah but the rest of the episode features some really good fight scenes some escape scenes where the super soldiers trying to and crosshairs are like going at it and the you know throws them off a waterfall but he still survives like that was really intense that was really good stuff 
Uh, so I liked it. Yeah, it was a very good episode. So, um, the next episode is Bad Territory, eh, which is kind of a nothing episode, in my opinion. We get what's her face, Fenric, what's her face from Book of Boba Fett. And I guess she was in The Mandalorian for a bit, too. Fenric Schrand? Is that her name? I don't know. Whatever. Um, so... <laughs> so, um... Yeah, she is. It was, and they just had her, like, have Hunter and Wrecker team up with her to capture this guy. And the guy was, like, really dangerous. And uh, there's monsters in the water tried to kill them. Yeah, yeah it's, so it's like a typical cartoon episode so whatever anyway <laughs> next episode uh the harbinger where we get another cameo of a well-known character this time uh god what's her name a centrist vaj Va hold on i gotta look this up asaj ventress that's her name okay asaj ventress you know the one from clone wars who was um, Dooku's secret apprentice or whatever. Um, and then she turned into a bounty hunter after he tried to kill her. So, um, here's the thing about this episode. This episode, I think, is not terrible. I wouldn't call it a, a really horrible episode. But it is entirely filler. It is the most filler episode of the season, in my opinion. Because the story of this episode is um, Ventress basically testing Omega to see how high her M count is. By the way, they never say in the show that M count means metachlorine count. But you know that's what they're getting at, which is interesting. And it's funny because when she said, oh, I'm going to test her, I assume that meant like what they did later in the, what they had... Um, What's that stupid bounty hunter's name? I forget his name. I don't like him. Cad Bane. Anyway, what they had him do, where he had this, like, pad, and he, like, you know, s took a sample and stuck it in them and, and could see, oh, look, and the little pad came up and said, ooh, this is what their M count is. But instead, she just had him do all this karate kid bullshit. <laughs> like, how does that tell her what her fucking M count is? That was not what I was expecting. But anyway, the, so in the episode, the whole point is her making Omega do these tests, and Hunter, Wrecker, and Crosshairs are dicks to her because they don't like her, and they try to kill her, but they fail, and eventually let her go, and blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, None of this is relevant. None of this comes back uh, for the rest of the show. Like, the, the her having a high M count is, of course, crucial to the idea of why, um, what's his face? God, why well, I forgot his name already. You know, the, the evil guy, the evil doctor guy, uh, Hemlock, yes. It's crucial to why Hemlock wants her, but... We already know she has a high M count, so the test to see whether or not she actually does have a high M count are relevant because she, we never actually see her use the force. We never actually see her aim count come back. In fact, at the end of the episode when Ventress says, oh yeah, she failed, she doesn't have an IM count. But it's implied that she's lying because Hunter's like, no, you're, I believe you're lying. So it's heavily implied that she's lying. And again, that never comes back. Now, if Omega appears later in another show, and they could make it relevant and be like, ooh, she does, can, does have force abilities. But for this show, it's complete filler. <laughs> it's a complete waste of time. And, you know, I think making it, another show, making this show, this episode relevant is kind of, bullshit <laughs> you just should be touched on again in this fucking show but that's just you know my opinion uh, um but anyway like the test she does doesn't make her she's like she has her stand on one foot on a slippery rock like how the 
I guess that Yoda had Luke doing shit like that in the Empire, so okay, I'll let that one go. But the next one, they have a run up to get this flower very that's very karate kid esque and it's just so cliche ish. And um how does that show whether or not she has a high M count? Because she just rode her like hound to get there and rode it back. Like she did that really normally, so it was that has nothing to do with an end count. And the one real test that actually seemed actually relevant where she had her Omega try to reach out with her feelings to sense the beasts or whatever. She did jack shit. She failed. So I when Ventra says at the end, Oh yeah, she failed that seems to track, but Hunter doesn't seem to think so. And they seem the sh- episode itself, the show seems to imply Ooh, Ventress is lying. She actually does have an IM count. And she obviously does have an high M count, by the way, because that's why fucking um, Hemlock wants her so badly. So we know she has an high M count, yet they don't do anything with it. Like, it doesn't become relevant other than the fact that that's why Hemlock wants her. And that's fucking annoying. It seems like a tease to me. But anyway. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't hate this episode. As I said, it was, it was just, it was pure filler. It was pure filler. Anyway, um, next episode is Identity Crisis. Uh, it's not. It's the one where Jordy LaForge turns into a, um, you know, lizard gecko and runs back to. Oh no, that's a different show. Ah, <laughs> uh, so no, it's the. So this one is again. You know, the Star Wars cartoons like to do this. And I, I like it. They switch focus and they'll have an episode that's just about the bad guys taking place on the base, and we learn about the specimens that it was like. Uh, you know, kids with a high M count. So for sensitive kids being uh, held so that they can use their DNA to try to for Project Necromancer which of course we know from Mandalorian 3 is teasing at making a clone for the Emperor which is what they do eventually in the Rise of Skywalker so in other words much like uh, other mentions in Mandalorian season 3 it is trying to retroactively make Rise of Skywalker good, which is a futile task, but (laughs) at least it makes it less bad, I suppose, (laughs) and makes it fit into canon better. Um, But anyway, like, and this is, of course, I I think we knew this in season two, because when season three first started, I already knew that this is what this thing was, so they must have mentioned it in season two. So it's not news, but, um... I think this is the episode that starts with Cad Bane capturing a little kid. I hate that character, but that was kind of a really dark scene. And it set this uh, episode up for the dark tone that it has. Now, it's centered on uh, Emery, who has her um, um, Damar moment where... Damar started, you know, hating himself and hating working for the Dominion and wanting to uh, leave them, and that's pretty much what happened to her. I don't think they did as good of a job in this episode. Like, it seemed kind of forced just because there were kids there, and she seemed to be okay with the kids at first, and all of a sudden she wasn't. And when they had, like, the little kid come up to her and be like, oh, are you going to be my friend or whatever, it was so obvious what they were trying to do. But it was okay. <laughs> it's still, I still mean, don't fault it for that, even though it's you know not particularly original. It was still interesting, and as I said, the dark tone really worked for it, so it's a decent episode. Uh, so next episode is Point of No Return, and I knew just by the title, even before I watched this episode, and mind you, I don't watch any trailers or anything for, or any, uh, or any videos that show me what the next episode is going to be about so I had no idea what the episode is going to be about I just saw the title Point of No Return and I knew oh this is the episode where they're going to capture Omega and take her back to the base (laughs) because that's kind of what happened in um, uh, The Mandalorian Season 2 they had an episode I can't remember what the episode was called it was called something like Tragedy or like bad thing happens and it was like oh so this is the episode they're gonna capture Gro- Grogu which is exactly what happens so see <laughs> I don't know point of no return is not as obvious as whatever that episode title Mandalorian was like 
bad. <laughs> Horrible thing. <laughs> Whatever. I think it was tragedy. Wasn't it tragedy? But anyway, it wasn't as obvious, but it was still like, oh yeah, the no, no return. So they're going to... So And sure enough, the um, super soldier goes to the... I can't remember this character, but I'm sure she's been in previous seasons. And it was like a friend or whatever, bounty hunter type person who's friends with them hunter and all of them but um anyway they he sneaks aboard her ship and gets the desired information i thought she was gonna figure this out and because she saw she knew someone was on the ship so i thought she was gonna like research her files and whatever and and try to and find out oh my god someone was in the ship and they stole the information it was about hunter so she was called contact hunter and be like oh my god you know this someone stole this information of where you are so they might be coming to get you you need to leave but now that didn't happen because so the episode could happen <laughs> so we could have it seems like she's stupid for not figuring it out to be honest but that's just my opinion so um they show up and the super soldier shows up there and confirms that omega's there so they can get the whole empire to come and like uh lock everything down and start like destroying shit and treating everyone there like shit and enacting a police state and trying to like pressure omega to give up and then hunter comes up with a plan to steal one of their ships to leave but that plan fails because they'd rather kill their own men than, than give him the opportunity to leave. So they're like really serious. These super soldiers are good villains. They're really scary guys. I think it does a effective job at it. And this was a really intense episode. Like I was on the edge of my seat for this one. And it was very interesting that she had to she managed to talk crosshairs into surrendering. So I kind of figured that as I said, I knew just from the title that they would end up capturing Omega in this episode, but I didn't see it coming where she would talk crosshairs into surrendering. I actually thought that she would, like, go behind his trick crosshairs and make him look the other way or something while she went and surrendered. But no, she actually talked him into it, and with the plan to um, put a tracker on, which crosshairs warned her, it was not a good plan, and he was correct. The trackers did not work, which I didn't see coming. And so it was really, really intense, really tragic episode. So uh, next episode is a juggernaut, which nothing can stop. And, and so this is when um, uh, Crosshairs informs Hunter that he does have a plan. He does know a way to try to figure out uh, where Tantus space is. But it's not very good. He doesn't like it, which is why he never mentioned it earlier. Plus, he admits that he doesn't want to go back there. But he didn't have a good enough reason before. Now he does because he needs to rescue Omega. And I love that sort of connection that they had. I think that worked at the start of the season of Omega building that connection with Crosshairs and believing in him and redeeming him. And I think this is when he wants to repair. I think the arc they took his character in this season I thought was very good. So they go to... Um, break this evil admiral guy out of prison who i don't remember but i suppose because it's been years since i've seen the first two seasons what do you want from me i don't even remember how he got there but i remember it, apparently i watched videos that said he was the one who destroyed uh, camino or whatever and i was like okay i think i barely remember this guy he was really forgettable anyway so they break him out and uh he's being a dick the whole time and and they had this huge escape scenes or whatever with them trying to get out. And I think it's out of this episode or the next episode where they show Omega returning to the base and him locks being a dick and throws her back in with the, all the specimens and, and she tries to, I don't know, whatever. And <laughs> so this episode was okay. This is a cog and machine. Uh, next episode is Into the Breach. Um, where the Bad Batch, with the help of the ad evil Admiral guy who's being a dick the whole time. I didn't really like his inclusion here. He was just an annoying character. And again, it's kind of another cliche where they take the evil bad guy and force him to help him and whatever. Um, 
but at least like so it reminded me of what they did with the evil uh empire guy from rebels i can't remember his name either but for him he actually actually did he did redeem himself and he actually did end up joining the rebellion so joining the right side whereas this guy did not redeem himself he remained an evil asshole which is kind of what I like that. I like how they didn't... Because it makes sense. It would have made no sense for him to redeem himself. That would have been out of character. Uh, and it was kind of forced for Rebels. But I buy it a little bit there. I wouldn't have bought it here. Um, so I'm glad it didn't go that way. I'll give him credit for that. But he was still annoying. And then they have Echo um, sneak aboard the ship. And uh, Hunter and all of them get on another ship and attach itself. To the ship, but then you know they find out. Uh, Hemlock finds out they're coming anyway. But uh, that happens in the next episode. But yeah, this episode was yeah, it was all right. It was pretty good. Anyway, uh, next episode is uh, part one. I would say the setup to the finale, uh, Flash Strike, where um, this is when you know Hunter and the Bad Batch come to rescue Omega and um, Echo sneaks on the base but as I said Hemlock realizes what's going on and um, is ready for them um, so yeah this is the setup for the episode Omega is finding a way to escape I think it's this episode where Emery meets up with uh, Echo and Aside of this one and the next one, they kind of blend together. But she meets up with Echo and uh, they try to find a way to rescue the... I think it might be the next one. But anyway, let me get to the next one. Though, because this this was basically your setup episode. So it was good at doing that. It was a good setup episode. But the next episode, uh, or in the finale, the last episode of the entire show, series finale, is the Calvary has arrived. So... This is what I want to say about these two parts, about this whole ending sequence. The one, it's really exciting, and I think it's really intense, and I really like it. But the one thing I don't like about it is that this mission actually would have been better off if Hunter, Crosshairs, and um, Wrecker stayed at home. And it just Echo went in. <laughs> Because here's the thing, um, they were like done. They were they rescued all the clones. Um, the children were safe. Emery took them out, and they were safe. And all the clones were safe. And Omega was safe. And they could have left, but no, they had to go back and rescue Hunter, Crosshairs, and Wrecker because those idiots just got themselves captured. Now, to be fair, they're not idiots. Um, because they were up against impossible odds, and they showed how awesome and amazing the super soldiers were. But the Bad Batch are supposed to be like these awesome, amazing heroes who can really kick ass, and so to see them being taken down so easily was kind of like, what are you guys doing here? And so they're taken down and captured and tortured and um, beaten, and Crosshairs has his hand cut off, but then they help um, Echo and the few surviving of his men to defeat the super soldiers after they've been tortured and, and captured and beaten. But before they've been beaten, they got their asses kicked. But after they've been beaten, they win. <laughs> now, granted, they had help from Omega and, the, and Echo and the others after. But still, they should be in much, much worse shape after being tortured like that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that part didn't sit right with me and plus not only could, if the three of them never showed up would everyone gotten out all those clones would still be alive but most of them died in the battle against the super soldiers only like a few of them survived so they all died because of the stupid bad batch <laughs> well, they should have just stayed at home just have Echo sneak on the ship and that be that Oh, although to be fair to be fair, um, they did provide that distraction that allowed Echo to move around to free everyone. To be fair. So maybe you do, you could argue you did need them to be there, but still. Uh, Omega 
made a really good distraction when she let out the Xylo Beast. Um, that was really amazing. Uh, I like that callback. They were sort of setting it up in earlier seasons. Ooh, there's a Xylo Beast here. Because, um, and I forgot about this, but a video reminded me the Emperor mentioned in an episode of the Clone Wars that he wanted to clone the Xylo Beast. Um, but I actually wish they would have done more with the Xylo Beast. I, rather than, they did have it wreak havoc and do its Godzilla thing for a bit, but then it just fucked off into the wilderness. Uh, <laughs> and, um,. But yeah, and then you get your classic showdown at the end. This is, again, very cliche. something I've seen a billion times before where Hemlock is holding Omega at gunpoint and they have uh, Crosshairs and Hunter, you know, standing by. And there's a Mexican standoff or like a big Western standoff. And then Omega stabs him in the arm and get to give him a shot. Like, I, just, I think I've seen that exact scene like at least ten other times. But... It was a good um, resolution to Crosshair's storyline, who was suffering uh, post-traumatic PTSD, basically, for what he went through at the prison and how his hand was shaking because of that. And that he, even after he got his hand cut off, he was able to redeem himself uh, by taking a shot. And plus, Hunter willing to trust him and work with him in order to save Omega. Uh, and and getting um, crosshairs to trust Omega that she would do her part. Um, so that that was good. So it was a satisfying ending as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and then uh, yeah, then we get to see them go back to the planet and have their happy ending. And Emery is uh, redeemed now, and it's, they're gonna help find the those kids' parents, and everything's all happy. And then. We flash forward to the future and, <laughs> and have this epilogue where uh, we see um, Hunter as the older old man and Omega is all grown up now and she's sneaking off to leave and Hunter catches her and is like, oh, where are you going, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I'm sorry, but I have to join the rebellion. So obviously implying this is taking place during... Sometime during the rebellion of um, leading up to A New Hope and all that. It could be before or after. We're not sure. A New Hope, that is. Um, but it's around that time. And um, she, you know, convinces him, has his love little talk with him. That, uh, stating that uh, his fight is over, but her fight needs to continue. And then she goes off. Now, I heard somewhere that the showrunner for this show, I believe, said something like that um, the final scene, the final scene of the final episode, he said, I, I challenge you not to cry uh, in, that, uh, in that scene. And I didn't cry. <laughs> there were no tears for that one. But, but... I did find it touching. I did find it satisfying. I thought that was a really good end. I thought that was a powerful resolution. To I love that. I love actually storylines that the endings that give you resolutions that should jump to the future, that show you this is what happened in the future, and we see that she's grown up and she goes to join the rebellion, which makes a ton of sense. So I like that ending. I really, really love that ending. So. Um, I think I would go as far as to say that this is my favorite episode of the season. I thought it was a powerful finale. I thought it really worked. Yeah, it had a few cliches, a few contrivances in there. But that's okay. And again, I wasn't expecting much. Like, I wasn't expecting it to be as good as the finale of Rebels, which it wasn't. But I didn't think it would be, so that's fine. <laughs> um, but, uh... Because, as I said, like, my expectations for this whole season was very low, and it easily exceeded those low expectations, and it was much better. If I came in with, like, high expectations, expecting the best season ever, I would I probably would have been disappointed, but I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't really that invested in this show, to be honest. And, yeah, as I said before, I think this was easily the best season. 
of the show. Now, let's get into speculation here. So, um, speculating, uh, I've heard people speculating that Omega is going to get her own show and spin off and do her own show. Now, I don't know. Like, anything's possible, and I wouldn't be opposed to the idea as long as it wasn't the Omega show. Like, if they do another cartoon and she is one of the main cast members and in a group of others, then I'd be okay with that. And, you know, even if it was took place during Rebels, like, or after Rebels, like maybe during the New Hope or whatever, <laughs> during the original trilogy, um, I could be on board with that. It, it really depends, though. Um, that, uh, because it would be interesting if it was taking place during Rebels, because Rebels only focused on that one little planet for the most part, and so just that tiny section of the galaxy, so they could explore another place uh, where the rebels were fighting that had nothing to do with that, and with Omega, and, and have some familiar characters and whatnot, and that might be interesting. Or, um, yeah, because in that time period, we did get a bunch of stuff in it, but just, like, as I said, rebels only focused on that tiny planet, and uh, Andor's, like, serious boring drama i'm sorry it is boring <laughs> it's all serious and dire and so it's not the fun adventure that these cartoon shows are so i don't know i'd be open to that but there's also the possibility that they she doesn't get her own show or becomes a main character in another show and instead shows up in live action um being a main character in something like the mandalorian or ahsoka or you know the movie that's coming out or whatever um and sure that's possible too and i would be okay with that as well i wouldn't be disappointed oh they didn't give her own show uh that wouldn't disappoint me that would be fine too i'd be a-okay with that but I would really love that they do show her again. It would I'd be very disappointed if they don't. Um, I kind of doubt that would happen, but I, I, hopefully not. And they need to if they need to show her again, they need to resolve the whole M count thing because at the moment it didn't really count to jack shit. By the way, something else I forgot to talk about with the finale is that um, it kind of makes sense because they're talking about Project Necromancer. However, that didn't happen in the canon until much much later and it makes total sense i love how they tied that up because everything got destroyed all of his research got destroyed he got killed so necromancer was nowhere and so admiral tarkin was like let's divert all funds to project stardust which of course is the death star so and we know that's what they bank everything on uh, but we do know that during the Mandalorian time, they're trying to resurrect the idea of Project Necromancer. Um, so, I mean, they must have been working on it slightly before then in order to have the material. But maybe that's explained in Mandalorian Season 3. I don't fucking remember. <laughs> I, I've only seen these things once. Can't expect to remember every little detail. I'm not a Star Wars expert, unfortunately. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I stated my favorite episode of the season, which is The Calvary Has Arrived. Um, I think a close second would probably be Shadows of Tantus when um, Crosshairs escaped. And after that, the two-parter, um, Infiltration and Extraction. I think those, uh, yeah, those were both really good. Uh, as for the worst episode, I'd probably have to go with Paths Unknown. Even though technically I didn't watch it, I fell asleep during most of it, but it was so boring, which is why I fell asleep during it, and I think it was totally unnecessary, so yeah, that, that would probably be my least favorite. But anyway, my rating for The Bad Batch Season 3 out of 10 is going to be a 9 excellent. It's a weak 9, to be sure. It's very close to an 8. If I did 0.5s, it would be an 8.5s, but I don't do 0.5s. I don't. <laughs> I don't do that. So it's, um, I don't cop out. Yeah, that's the term I'm looking for. I don't cop out. 
but anyway so nine uh excellent it's a pretty yeah it's a solid season it's easily my favorite of the show um it's a couple of filler episodes here and there but for the most part it's more it's really exciting the through storyline of and it was really intense i would say is a good word for it and uh yeah i found that ending pretty pretty satisfying actually even though there was a bit cliche story in there but yeah as i said like i wasn't expecting that much with this season and i definitely exceeded those expectations so that is it for my review of the bad batch season three uh you can check out my channel as i cover mostly star trek and many other um shows and stuff as well so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that and thanks a lot for watching